Hold on, let me just move a couple things out of the way. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. We, we, we don't mind your messy desk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just I have, me, a messy joking, desk? I don't have a messy joking. desk. <laughs> don't put the evidence on, uh, on camera. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because there's sometimes there's a thing in my screen over there, and I often yeah. put stuff up there, and then only when I'm like on here, I'm like, oh, shit. I got to text that. Good afternoon there, Elisa Betts Lacroix. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you too. Yeah, well, likewise. Exactly. We well, we meet, met you a, a year ago now, over a year ago. Um, at a podcast movement in Philadelphia and it was a really great sort of uh, meeting and you were super kind to uh, ask I us. I remember that. Yeah. that was so cool because let's see I had somehow come across your show and I can't remember exactly how but I was listening to your show and really really digging it I was really all oh, these guys are so fun and I hadn't really you know thought anything about oh maybe you know it hadn't occurred to me but then when I met you and I saw your t-shirts <laughs> oh my god you're the two guys from that show oh, that, so it was so fun it was amazing because yeah. you guys were one of the you, you you were one of the first people to come up to us and like one of you know to say we i'd listened to your show and we're like wow it's someone had listened to our show you know like we had that kind of feeling it was in real life it was really awesome <laughs> yeah you were in early fairly early stages as was yeah. i at the time and so you, it's kind of like you're putting it out there and you don't really know if who's listening or yeah. you see random numbers <laughs> and downloads that doesn't really mean anything <laughs> yeah yeah exactly we were like oh wow we have a fan that's so cool <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's classic so so yeah and then you were very kind to uh, ask us to come on your podcast which you did like a live podcast there which is really awesome um yeah yeah, great show and um yeah now we're we're super happy to have this opportunity to sort of you know pay you back and have you on our podcast which is awesome awesome yeah i I love your show i really enjoy it and so it's really great to get to come and chat with you cool yeah well you have uh, such a fascinating inspiring and and like a diverse background story and we're just like really really excited to sort of get stuck into it um so so we can just kind of start off you know basically it seems like entrepreneurial flair uh, basically runs in your family uh, your your folks ran a brick and mortar business um for for a long time you know as long as you've been alive and uh, you grew up in canada um so maybe you can sort of take us back to those early memories of growing up what what was it like for you Oh, well, so my parents have an entrepreneurial background, but I also come from a pretty deep and rich performing arts background. So when I was born, my father was a touring folk musician and uh, he had a TV show at one point, he was a recording folk performer. And for the first, or sorry, it was, it was actually just before I was born, for the couple, but three or four years before I was born, he was touring around Europe and playing and was getting some notoriety in the States and in Canada. And uh, I think just around the time that my mom got pregnant with me, he decided that he didn't want to be touring anymore because he wanted to be around to have a family and raise a family. And so he quit touring and the band broke up. Hmm. And at that time they split and it was the trio basically. And one of the guys named Denny, um, you, probably are too young and too far away to maybe even know who this is, but he's, he turned out to have moved to LA when the band split up and he met a woman named Mama Cass and they formed this band called the Mamas and the Papas. No way. And yeah. You know, you know the band? Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my dad, my dad's uh, group was called the Colonials at one point and Halifax three at another point. And when he decided to stay home in Toronto with my mom because he wanted to raise a family, he decided to change careers altogether. He didn't want to keep touring. Uh, Denny left and met Mama Cass and John Phillips and, um, you know, and then they brought Michelle in and they formed the Mamas and Papas. And so, you know, when I was about three years old, I remember my parents going down to L.A. It was my dad actually tells this story of how when I was little, maybe I guess I would have been three or four driving down the street and suddenly hearing this voice coming over the radio with a new hit that was California Dreaming. I was like, oh my God, that's Denny. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. So I, so my dad has, uh, was a, has continued to sing and has continued to be a patron of the arts. And he 
switched over into a career in photography, and, which brings us back to the point that you raised, which is when I was um, very young, my father decided, well, I need to get a career. It's going to be artistic that can keep me in Toronto so I can actually raise a family. And he decided to be a photographer because he loved photography. And so he started to shoot. He'll tell you he, he shot bands and strippers and weddings and, and you know, and, uh, you know, drag performers. And, um, and then he moved into commercial photography. And over many decades, he became a very well-known photographer in Canada. But that was the start of it. And so when I was growing up, my parents had this brick and mortar photography business that I worked in when I was a teenager. And you know, I saw them running it together. And in their situation, they had a really great partnership where my mom did all of the background work and preparation and business and propping and casting. So my dad could just focus on two things and that was mm. his photography and entertain the clients because he's more of the front man extrovert and my mom was a bit more introverted. So yeah, they had a great partnership and I grew up really in that business. Hmm, that's so cool. Eh? And then, and have, you know, what's like so cool is like they realized, I guess what their strengths were and uh, they sort of focused on those and, and there was just like this great teamwork. It sounds like, you know, to run the business. Definitely. Definitely. And you know, it's interesting because I think my mom struggled over the years with feeling like she was behind the scenes. And, you know, I was born in 65. So in 1970, when I was five and she joined my dad to, to run the business, she went back to work. She stayed home for the first five years of my life. And when she went back, she ran his business. And even though it was a great fit in terms of their skill set, there was always a part of her that felt like mm. you know, I should be doing something more, or it was during a very, you know, big change in terms of, what was called women's lib then you know mm -hmm. and um it was the days of the bra burning and she always had this feeling like she should do something else and she always felt a little bit like she was behind the scenes even though that was really kind of where she preferred to be yeah but the thing that's really beautiful i think is that when my dad uh became more well known and started winning awards he would always acknowledge her. he would always say you know, when he went up, he received a lifetime achievement award through his uh, union, which is called CAPIC. And when he received the reward, the award, he went up to this thing and he said, this is not mine. This belongs to me and to Patty. Oh, and, cool. um, you know, fun thing about my parents is they were born eight hours apart in the same province. What? Um, my dad was born late March 16th and my mom was born early March 17th. So their names uh -huh. are both Pat. <laughs> 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 So my dad's Patrick and my mom's Patricia. And no so way. <laughs> a classic. The, the yeah. world was meaning for them to be together. That is for sure. Exactly. Yes, uh, they were together for 53 years when my mom died a few years ago. So. Wow. Wow. That's, Jeez. That's what a great story. Yeah, yeah that's a great story. And um, yeah, you, you have such an exotic look yourself. Like, um, you know, where are your folks from? So my mother... My mother was third generation born Japanese Canadian, which means that her family came from Japan, from Tokyo in the late 1800s. <laughs> so her mother was born in Canada, but was full blooded Japanese. And then my mother was this, you know, second generation born in, in Canada, but also full blooded Japanese. So the time, by the time we got to me, I, you know, I, my mom's, my mom didn't speak Japanese all that well, but she looked Japanese. She was essentially a culturated Canadian, whereas my grandparents had slight accents. Um, and I actually didn't, you know, tried to teach my sister and me some Japanese, but we didn't really, we didn't do that well with it. And then my <laughs> father's side is mostly French and his family came from, to Canada from the 1600, in the 1600s from France. Mm. So I'm like 24 generations Canadian on my dad's side. So mostly, goodness, yeah. So that's uh, my that's why my, my background is, and I yeah, identify as so. race. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's oh, awesome. <laughs> it's lovely. Those those kind of those history, those tales from the, the from the past. Um, I don't know what they mean sometimes, you know, but it it's kind of cool just to explore them a little bit and and just see where you where you come from. Even though your life is is totally separate in some ways, it's still linked to those. Um, you know, forefathers or foremothers in, in some way too, hey? Definitely. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, and it's so, yeah, sorry, carry on. Carry on. No, <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say it's linked 
and there's so many layers, right? So there are layers of story and layers of history and layers of experience and things that were impacted by generationally. Mm -hmm. and then there's our own unique stories. So like, for example, I'll give you an example of that. I don't know if you would know about this, but in both States and in Canada, during the Second World War, anyone of Japanese descent was interned. <laughs> and so they were, um, they were, they had 24 hours. My mom, when she was three in 1942, uh, all the Japanese Canadians on the West Coast of Canada and also in the US were given 24 hours to pack all their belongings up and they were put in internment camps for the duration of the war. No and worries. promised their, their uh, belongings back, but most, almost all of them did not get them back. So my mom was interned in what was a Japanese Canadian internment camp in the interior of BC, the interior of British Columbia, which is the province that she, grew, she was born in in Canada from the time she was three until she, when she was eight. Okay. And so that's the kind of history, right, that has some impact and definitely influences and informs who she is and who the people of her generation were. But it also, on some level, is transmitted down through cross generations, you know, in terms of just the legacy of experiences like that. Yeah. And, um, you know what's crazy though about that is that you can you can be a normal like Canadian citizen, you're doing your thing, going to work, you're a Canadian, and then you're like, oh wait, sorry, you're going into the like because you look a certain way in a way where you have some heritage. How crazy. Yeah, it's exactly, it is exactly that. And they, um, you know, a lot of the people who were put in the Japanese internment camps in Canada and the States, they've never been to Japan. They, some of them didn't even speak, my, my mom didn't even speak Japanese. Oh, uh, and so, you know, it, it, my mom's generation, like I say, my mom was three until she was eight. So her memories of it aren't so terrible. She mostly remembers that at, it as a period of time when all the adults were around and the men were around and everyone was together and people weren't going off to work because they were in the camps. But mm. the generation that it really had a hugely negative impact on is the generation ahead of her. So for example, her uncles and her mother who were 18, 19, 20 when they were interned and then they came out to a still racist world. Yeah. Um, having missed basically 18 to you know 24 25 years old which is pretty critical in terms of laying your foundations of your adulthood so i think that, that generation was the one that was really deeply impacted mm. wow i i didn't know that at all it's so uh, thanks so much for sharing that did were they um were they like treated really badly in the camps well i mean i guess that's relative right mm. i did interview my aunt who's 96 hmm. recently hmm. and I have some more interviewing for, to do with her she's thankfully like very sharp still and she has a great memory she's fading you know um, but that's there's a very few number of people left now um, yeah. especially of that age who were adults during the internment but what she she was actually spent a chunk of the period of time that she was interned living in a horse stall in an ex in an exhibition stadium on the fairground hmm. in BC. Hmm. So I would say that's not the best circumstances. Um, other people like my mom, they were in a house, a pretty reasonable house. You know, you could argue that it wasn't so terrible. I think they were three families in the house, so it was pretty crowded. But the more important thing is their freedom was taken away and their possessions were taken away. Um, just to sort of wrap up that story so you have a little bit more of the, the, the general big picture of it. In 1988, a lot of Japanese Canadians were given redress, which is the president, basically, uh, the Prime Minister of Canada um, made a formal apology and they were all given $21,000, people of a certain age of Japanese uh, ancestry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people would argue it doesn't really make up for it, what they lost. My, my mother's family lost a hotel business, other people lost fishing boats, and, mm -hmm. um, but that redress happened in 1988 in Canada and I believe in 1989 in the U.S. So, wow. um, but anyway, I don't know if I answered your question. You know, I think no, it's all did. Was that was <laughs> great. That wow. was a great bonus. <laughs> how do you come to that number? You know, like it's so ridiculous how you're like, okay, we're going to choose 21,000. Like that, that's going to be the number. <laughs> that's just so crazy how these, yeah. I mean, what, what yeah. do you do? I, I don't know how they came about. I know it was a long process of fighting for that redress. 
and I'm guessing there probably was some amount proposed to the governments that were then split between certain numbers of people of certain ages. Um, wow. You know, it's, it's interesting because I don't know that much about it right now, but it's, you know, it's being discussed now among some circles that in the States that we actually redress, we actually give redress to, to African Americans for the history of slavery that has been yeah. packed by so deeply. <laughs> Paying um, reparations, yeah. Yeah, reparations for for I guess the call reparations, right? And I don't know how you how do you figure that out? I mean, the one thing is for sure in both the cases of Japanese Canadians, Japanese Americans, and any future reparations to African Americans uh, who are impacted by slavery, you certainly can't touch the actual impact. It's largely a symbolic gesture, right? And, and an attempt at least recognizing inequity. And mm. so to some degree, the number, like you say, is kind of random. <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a really fair. Gareth and I have actually spoken about this, you know, in, in the context of um, sort of chauvinism and, and male sort of dominance in the past and, and, and how much, how much does, because like say, say we didn't do anything now as, as two youngsters, you know, whatever, but, but maybe our heritage or our forefathers did. So, so we have, how how much responsibility is ours now versus um you know there's the, the the milk has been spilt you know but but so we have to take some responsibility in how much is ours now you know it's quite complex really you know the whole the whole scenario it's so complicated i think as soon as you get into differences between people's experience whether you're talking about gender or you're talking about race you're talking about social economic advantages and you try to parse it out or work it backwards so there's equity i think it's so complicated mm. and in terms of you know in terms of um like responsibility i have such mixed feelings about it because i think that it, i certainly understand people's feeling like well it wasn't me you know it wasn't me that that was involved and i mean i think ultimately that's the bottom line is that we have to you know one of the beliefs i have about people in general is that we're essentially good and I think the more that we can understand that, the better. And, but then again, on the other hand, the other side of it is that most of us have privilege of some kind or another, whether it's white privilege or male privilege or white acculturation or wealth or, um, and, I, and then yeah, that's just another whole like complicated topic because I have really mixed feelings about the whole idea of privilege too you know mm -hmm. and it's dangerous it's like a landmine you can't really you, know, know. <laughs> you don't like, want to say anything because you're like yeah. oh i'm guaranteed to like you know upset millions somebody by just saying this you know what i mean like totally. yeah, yeah like it's like it's actually a really important conversation to have mm. but you really need to be having it in a safe environment you know with people that are able to debate topics uh, like on a, on a very like intellectual level, you know, and not just get too emotional about it. So it's super hard to find, you know, just to do that, I think, but uh, yeah. And I mean, the, the reason is, the reason it's hard is because the people that might be most engaged in that conversation are people who might've been really negatively impacted in big ways. hundred you know? yeah. percent. So therefore there's going to be a lot of emotions around it. But exactly. Yeah, it's, it's like everybody's and they're signaling to everyone this is how they feel, and they're also representing other people, so that adds that other layer of like, I've got to say what I'm feeling. So yeah, it gets really can get pretty hectic, you know. Jeez. But yeah, yeah, this is good to discuss these things, like with someone like yourself who has you know family ahead that have been through tough times, and you understand it so intrinsically, you know. I mean, yes, and I think a lot of people would say, well, you've got so much privilege. I mean, I, can, I know that I've gotten into conversations around race where I've been, you know, I, I don't want to say my opinion has been dismissed, but it's been brought to my attention that I have a lot of privilege too. And mm. it's true, I do have a lot of privilege. And In what way, sorry? Well, I grew up pretty white acculturated. And mm. I grew up in a family that was upwardly mobile. You know, when I was young, my parents didn't have a lot of money, but it was definitely upwardly mobile. And my parents, neither of them have like a lot of higher education, but they're both smart. And, you know, and I guess this is where it comes down to it is that so much is relative. And I think the danger around privilege, and I'm going to say this, I'm a little nervous to say it because like, this is on like a recording, but 
sometimes the word privilege is used as a little bit as a weapon. And sometimes there can be a little bit of a competition around, well, you know, I'm more underprivileged or more damaged yeah. than you are. Therefore, you don't get to have an opinion. Mm. And, and it doesn't, you don't have to be, you know, a white, straight Christian male to, to be, I mean, those are going to be the most, the most likely ones to be like, you don't have any say because you're a white, straight Christian male. Yeah. But there's a lot of, there can be sometimes jockeying that I think is really unfortunate in terms of my voice is more valid than your voice because I'm more underprivileged than you or, mm. I don't know, I guess the bottom line of it is hopefully that we all, hopefully we all can show up in what I believe is our true nature, most of us, which is curious and open-minded mm -hmm. and willing to be wrong and willing to learn and willing to consider someone else's perspective. But it, it can be a landmine and it is difficult. I mean, it's difficult because there have been people who have been, you know, pained and damaged and experienced inequity and racism and sexism and, you know, all the things. Mm -hmm. Well said, Lisa. Wow. Yeah. You did forget um, tall, white, white Christian male. Oh, tall, right. <laughs> Able-bodied. <laughs> so, look, you, you're obviously very passionate about, about learning and, and understanding things, and you were even sort of early on from a younger age. Um, even though it sort of, you didn't have a very fulfilling experience, um, you, you felt the engagement of learning was, was missing a little bit at school, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I remember being around five and just feeling like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to go to school. I'm going to learn so many things and it's going to be so exciting. And you know, I got to school and I didn't find it to be that. Now, I have no, I'm so curious what the school systems are like in your, in your countries, but um, I don't, my guess is that they have some limitations that are parallel to the limitations in our school systems, uh, partly because I think it's the system itself that it's very hard to educate a large group of people in one way when people are so diverse and individual. So I'm guessing you might have some of the same problems we have, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. And that is that yeah. you have to kind of teach to the massive middle. And so anyone yeah. that's different in any way doesn't really get their needs met. Really. And so, yeah, I, I, I felt that the school system, I was disappointed. I didn't feel there was a lot of critical thinking that was taught. I didn't, even when I was, I remember seven or eight or nine, I remember thinking the problem with this school system is that we don't actually have to think. We're just having to re remember things and repeat them back. And that's not what I imagined learning to be. Hmm. You know, I really wanted to be more engaged in, in the process of learning because I was excited about the idea of learning for its own sake. And so, yeah, I didn't really have a really good experience um, through school. Um, you know, pretty much across the board. I mean, I just did fine, and I don't think anyone, I was got good marks, and I was always well-behaved, and, you know, but it wasn't really what I wanted it to be, and I knew that when I got closer to having kids, I knew that, you know, I want them to have more engaged experience as a learner than I did. Mm. You, you must have been one of the only kids that was like, I really want to learn at school. <laughs> Why are you guys not teaching me? This is, <laughs> this is rubbish. <laughs> I was a well-behaved kid. I didn't, I went, and I wasn't, I was a little bit quiet. I mean, quieter than I am now. And I was probably a little bit shy. I think, I think I was. <laughs> uh, and um, so I wasn't the one challenging the teachers. I wasn't that kind of kid, you know, I was more of the kind of kid that blends in and that, goes unnoticed and is d does fine but is a little bit dying on the inside you know um and and i wasn't i'm not so divergent in my thinking or in my ability to fit into a mold like i'm pretty i i i've always been able to compromise on some of my individual for better and for worse on some of my own individual needs for being related for being connected for being in community for being a part of Mm -hmm. And, you know, typically, as I, what I know about education, especially divergent learners, that often is more common for girls. So if you look in the world that I've spent a lot of time in as an adult, and that is serving and being an advocate for what we call gifted learners, it's a terrible word, by the way, but we use the word gifted in the States to identify people who have a pretty high capacity to learn or have a very divergent way of learning that fits, doesn't really fit in the box. And as I've been an advocate for kids like that and for learners like that, 
um, I, you know, I, I've noticed that in that group, a lot of times it's the girls who will sort of blend in and what we say, like dumb down or, you know, make themselves fit in because they're not willing to give up the relatedness, the community, the connection. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's total, gen total generalization because it isn't always gendered like that. But a lot of times boys either um, just, you know, aren't as oriented for that connect connection, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, like yeah. I say, very, very much a generalization, yeah. but there's some scientific basis to women's brains and female brains being more, more oriented and more wired for relatedness. Yeah, yeah. And so, so when you say a gifted, are you talking about like, like autistic or just like really smart kids? What, what does that actually mean? Oh, interesting. So I mean, it's possible you don't use that, 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 that um, label. It's a pretty common label in the States that basically means, I mean, some people perceive it as you're saying, if you say, well, I have a gifted kid that it can kind of set the wrong buttons up. People are like, well, every kid is gifted. What do you, my kid's gifted too. What do you think? Your kid's so smart. But really what it means in educational circles and in educational psychology is that uh, kids who, or people, who IQ test at a certain level above the norm. So okay. I like to really make it clear that it's not about being smart, although a lot of people would simplify it to that. It's about being the type of smart that mm. does well on IQ tests, which okay. is a particular type of brain that does well on that. There's all kinds of smart, right? There's all kinds of gifted. There's all, it's, a mis mm. it's a misnomer. It's not a great mm. word. Even those yeah. of us who are in education don't like the word gifted because it has the wrong implications, but we don't have a better word right now. <laughs> so I don't ask, is there an alternative? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, divergent thinkers, divergent learners, um, some ways you can identify it that's more quantifiable is people who IQ test off the standard deviations off the norm. Yeah. So for example, the norm is 100 just by definition. And then like a standard deviation, two or three standard deviations below 100 in terms of IQ testing would be people that are, um, uh, I don't know what the current, the proper term is now. Uh, you, you it's know, a, yeah, we know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, like you <laughs> you know what it is? I don't know. Like, I don't want to say the wrong thing. People that are have, you know, they have challenges for learning. They have learning yeah. challenges. Hard of learning, or learning difficulties, or learning, di yeah. learning difficulties, or learning differences. I guess, but yeah. that's that's not the best word because it's all learning differences. Yeah. And I guess that's the point that I'm wanting to make is that kids who are fitting into this range that are the IQ test two or three or four standard deviations above the norm, they're as unusual and as unique as kids who get mm. very a very great degree at least in this country much more likely get educational um you know facilities or educational um things that are specific to their educational needs mm. and kids that test uh, two or three or four standard deviations above the norm are most like oh they're smart they'll be fine but the mm. reality is they have their own unique needs and you mentioned autism so there are, there's definitely a much greater correlation for kids that test two or three or four standard deviations above the norm to have what we call, to be what we call twice exceptional or 2E, which means they also have other challenges. And some of that might be spectrum, spectrum disorders like Asperger's or, or, mm. or autism, but some of it can also be like hypersensitivity in terms of like physical sensitivity to, I don't, you might experience this in your chiropractic practice yeah um, craig in terms of people having hypersensitivities to how they experience their bodies some people mm, are really, really so. sensitive to tags or um some people are um really sensitive to emotional interactions the other thing is they end up being so different from most of the people that they don't necessarily have people that can understand them and that's yeah amazing. Challenging, you know. So yeah. anyway, that's a whole topic. Yeah. That we yeah. No, it's a fascinating though, isn't it? Yeah. And actually, yeah. you obviously must fit in that gifted category using mathematical terms like standard deviations and stuff. So um, <laughs> just, I mean, I'm only know, joking. Well, that, that's the thing is that I, you know, that's an interesting thing, right? I've actually never been IQ tested myself, but I have kids who both have, and uh, their dad is someone that probably is very. Our number of 
standard deviations. I'm not sure how I would test, honestly, because my type of brain, I mean, I'm, I'm very smart, but my type of brain is not the linear type that necessarily does well and has terrible mathematics, for example. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But the type of brain I have is an integrative brain, that, and it's an ADHD, ADHD brain I discovered a few, discovered a few, discovered a few years ago. A few years ago. Uh, different, I, different types of ideas and, and um, seemingly disparate concepts and topics and bring them together and integrate because I have that kind of brain that kind of like um, synergizes. Yeah. Uh, it, and I'm not a linear thinking person, so I'm not sure how well I would do on an IQ test. I'm not sure. They're, they test different things too. But yes, I have a lot of experience in it because I had, uh, I have two kids, and one they are very different in the way they show up in the world. But I, I had one kid, for example, that learned how to read without being taught on their own when they were two and a half. Hmm. And so it was clear that that kid was going to need a different kind of learning environment and wasn't going, you know, going to fit into school very well. I mean, they probably would have. They didn't go to school, so they probably would have fit into school fine, but it would have been a different choice. And I, I had the vision that their desire and their curiosity and their, their passion for learning and reading not be stifled by being in that classroom situation where everyone's learning, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, <laughs> totally. when they knew how to read. You know? Yeah, 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 it totally. Makes yeah. So much sense when you say it like that. And, you, and we, everyone just gets forced into the same box. You know, it's crazy when yes. you, when you, when yeah. you see it like that and imagine, imagine sitting that, that your child into that environment mm -hmm. and you think, my goodness, like you, you're already here and then, okay, let's take two steps back, calm down, slow down, you know? Yeah. You're too clever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what happens so much with those kids is they get labeled as ADHD when they're maybe not, or they get labeled as behavioral difficulties because they're bored and they don't know how to moderate their own, you know, how to redirect their their passion for learning or their brains are being on fire into something different. So they just, they don't have anyone to help them with it because they don't have the proper type of support and educational, um, you know, interactions. And so they end up, you know, acting out in ways that have been labeled in ways that are not accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Really fascinating. Um, so, so talking about school and, and, and these sort of things, uh, two years into university, you decided, You'd had enough and it was time to hang up your boots and <laughs> go to uh, go to be an actor. You'd, you'd got all the education you needed. <laughs> and yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, that story is... So what happened in that case was I was an actor all the time I was growing up. I always acted in community theater. And when I was in in high school, I, uh, I worked as a model. And, you know, I said my father was a photographer, so I grew up modeling. I was modeling as a kid and for him and for other people doing catalog stuff and I always acted I always performed I always sang and I always loved acting and so I auditioned for and got into a really great theater school in Toronto and I also got into an okay school I hadn't put that much attention into the university that I got into but when I was graduated from at the time it was grade 13 in Canada we don't have that anymore I had to make the decision whether I should go to theater school or whether I should go to university. And my parents, like I said, had never, neither of them had gone to university. And I'd always been told that passion I had at five, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna get to learn things. And I'd always been told, well, when you get to university, you're gonna meet amazing people and you're gonna get, and they had this vision of university as being this place where I'm gonna have like intellectual conversations and philosophical discussions and I'm gonna meet other people who are engaged with learning. It's gonna be amazing. And so I had to decide if I wanted that or if I wanted to go to theater school. And, and I'm telling this story because I think it's important and informative for anyone who has a passion and an interest and how easy it is for us to derail ourselves from our dreams and from our vision by the limiting stories, right? So I remember going to the theater school, my dad drove me with the check in my hand and I had to decide, do you want to walk in the door and hand in your deposit check for theater school or do you want to go tear it up and go to university and I remember sitting there wishing my dad would tell me what to do <laughs> I was like Lisa I can't tell you what to do I'm sorry but you'll make the right decision and I remember sitting there for quite a long time and then finally saying okay fine I'm not gonna go drive away <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so why why did I do that because because there was a part of my brain that thought what do you mean that's silly you can't you're not gonna be an actor People don't make it as actors. And, you know, it's 
it's, it's like such a long shot. Uh, it's a pipe dream, just go to university. So that's what I did. And the irony is I had the exact same experience in university that I had in, in, in the other schools, you know, and I, I didn't choose very well. So I went to a school instead of intellectual and philosophical conversations, it was all beer and football games. And that was not my thing, you know? <laughs> And so, and then I changed school. So I went to school in Montreal and I studied fine art. And I felt like, I don't really know. I haven't lived enough life to really know what my art is about. Truth is I didn't really like fine art. I mean, I love making things, but I just went because somebody had said, oh, like I've been told when I was growing up, oh, you're so good at art because I can draw. I don't really care about art, you know? <laughs> so anyway, I dropped out with the idea that I'm just gonna drop out for a year to find out who I am and try to get my story. So I'll go back and then I'll finish my art degree. And, and the irony is, once I dropped out, I ended up completely getting into theater and having the next, spending the next 12 years as an actor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it just, I feel like it's such a story that illustrates how limiting it can be if we don't actually if we get the noise of the culture, if we let the stories and the limiting beliefs get into, into us too much, instead of mm. actually let, you know, who's to say I was able when I was, you know, 19 to really check in and go, this is really what you want to do. Like so much of it's retrospective. But I just, I find it ironic that I made that choice and ended up acting anyway. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It was this creative person just bursting wanting to come out of you and you were like <laughs> do what the what the norm is for a while it's crazy hey like and it's that comes back to like back to like what is intelligence and that's it's a sort of a norm that, that you know what should you do after school you must go to university and we, we we just fit into these things without even realizing it half the time and those are difficult decisions even now i think for i think it's changing a little bit but i think it must be tough for to know like do you just follow your heart or do you do you get a safe, do you go with a safety or, you know, it's, it's those are tough decisions to say, wow. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the really difficult things for people who are younger now, you know, I have kids who are 14 and 20 and, and I have a lot of friends in their 20s and in their 30s. And I think one of the big challenges now is there's so many opportunities and it's, it's explicit. I was in that in-between generation. I wasn't of the generation that was go and get a job and work there until you're 65. And, and also because I grew up in an entrepreneurial and artistic family, I didn't really have that message. But even generationally, I was not, there was, you know, the generation before me kind of was, yeah, you stick around. You're going to have one bitter pit. What are you going to do with you when, you're, when you grow up, right? And I was in that generation that, probably on the early side of it, where we've increasingly realized that we have various chapters and in, as time goes by and as the generations, you know, we go down in generations, I'm going to be, my kids will probably have five or six different careers. I've already had almost that many, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's becoming more and more common as life changes more and more quickly. And as, you know, as, as there's just so many more options. So I think one of the biggest challenges right now for young people is all the choices there are you know, um, that makes, it still does raise that same issue is how do you really know what voice is yours? <laughs> mm, yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Point, yeah. yeah. And yeah, you, you talk about sort of the acting world being very challenging at times and, uh, but you sort of took it on as a, a martial arts act, didn't you? Yeah. You know, Hmm. I think the thing about, I loved acting and I, and I loved, when I got into the business, especially in the film and television business, it is a really challenging business. And I mean, even when you're studying acting, you'll have teachers that say, if there's anything else you can do, do it. You hmm. know? And don't, don't do this because you think you're going to be a star or because you have, it, like anything that's artistic or anything that's challenging, I think you have to do it because you like, the day-to-day -day practice of what it means to be an actor. And the day-to-day -day practice of being an actor means studying, taking care of yourself, getting rejected, auditioning, getting rejected again, getting rejected again, you know, having this great hope, maybe you'll get this thing, having a huge celebration because you got a part, and then trying to learn that. Like, there's just so many uh, pieces to it, and one of the big pieces is 
even if you're a working actor, even if you're very lucky, is, is a lot of rejection. Um, mm -hmm. It just goes with the territory. And so I think because I was always most interested in the process of acting, I stopped saying, pro do you guys say process or process? We say process. 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 <laughs> we both said the different word. What do you mean? <laughs> I'd say process. Well, process. No, process. Yeah. Process. process. I'm like, what are you, American? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. No, I, I switch, you know. I mean, I'm I'm adaptable. If I'm challenging, yeah, yeah. you know, like, adaptability. <laughs> you excuse me a hard time about me and my Australian accent coming on. Yeah, <laughs> Craig is just trying to, you know, yeah, nothing. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what process is. I was actually just thinking of that word so much because recently I, um, I think one of you saw it because I, I think you commented on. I I found this old uh, acting demo, and one of the words I say this, and I and I was I've lived in the states for. Tw over 20 years now and I was just laughing because I say process in that video it's just like so Canadian I've <laughs> forgotten that we say it that way so anyway right now I'm saying process because I've lived in the states for a while but mm -hmm. what I loved about acting was the process of it I loved the self-exploration and deepening understanding and self-reflection and trying to understand what your where your emotions come from and how you access them and all that kind of stuff and so I the way I coped with, with the constant rejection was I took it on as a practice. And I like to say I did it like a martial arts studio where I thought I'm in this lab or this like martial arts studio where the challenge is, can I, can I stay steady? Can I stay okay in myself? Can I still believe that the path I'm going on is good and right for me, even in the face of rejection? Because otherwise, you just take rejection as, you know, as something that just probably beats you down. And, and so it was a way, I think, for me of, of making it a practice, you know, no. the practice being even in the face of this culture, this subculture that is the acting community, the film and television business saying, no, nope, not pretty enough. No, nope, not, you know, white enough. No, nope, not tall enough. No, nope, not whatever enough. Um, can I use that as the practice to say, and I'm back up and yes, I am. And now what's next? And so, you know, that was kind of my way of, you know, of make, of, I guess coping, but also making it be a process that was personal yeah. and personal growth oriented. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, like, I think you have to see it as this journey and like these things are just there to kind of, to challenge you on purpose and you need to see or find a way that's best for you to kind of deal with the, you know, the rejections and the letdowns and whatever. And, and, and it sounds like you, you know, that's, that was your coping mechanism and it was, it worked well for you, of course, you know? So it, you mentioned it now, like recently you published this, uh, this video of you on, on Facebook, like of all like your, your old roles and these sort of things. And I was like, no way is like <laughs> this lady's super famous. <laughs> um, so, so maybe you just, you want to tell us a little bit about the acting career you know you've you've appeared basically on tons of different shows and films and stuff yeah um well i studied acting from the time that i left i mean i studied it when i was like i said when i was younger and i acted when i was younger and then once i left college i went back to studying and i studied it pretty much in depth and i um, I was lucky and you have to have some luck as an actor and um, so I did do I did a lot of a lot of films I did a lot of I did radio dramas because those were big in Canada at the time we sort of come from a British history and I did a lot of commercials and then when I was 24 I kind of gave I was like oh my god I, I drove around to every casting director in, in Toronto and I handed in this little you know promotional flyer that I've made of myself and 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 I finally kind of gave up. I felt like I'd been hitting the pavement and I just wasn't really getting any of the acting work that I wanted. So I finally said, forget it. Okay, I'm going to go to Thailand. And I took off for Thailand in 89 and I went traveling around Thailand for mm, just a bit more than half a year. And I had just a life changing experience. I had so much, I mean, you both traveled a fair bit, right? So you, you know, like traveling is just so eye opening in terms of life and self and, um, you know, just, like amazing experiences that really challenge you, like you said, and grow you. And yeah, I had just an amazing experience. I have like 20 stories from that trip, I could tell you know. But I, I went there and then I came back and about 10 days after I got back from that trip, 
I got an audition for my first film job that I got, and I had this featured role in this um, film. And so that just started me off on, you know, what turned out to be about, you know, a decade of working in movies of the week and in series television. I had, I think, three different series regular roles, which is a great thing because you have, you know, ongoing work. And, um, and I worked in Toronto a lot, mostly on either Canadian or American films. At the time, the Canadian dollar was low, so a lot of American films, were, films and series were shot in Canada. And um, yeah, I had a great experience. I mean, I, lo I loved it and it was challenging. And then I decided, well, okay, I think I need to go to LA for a pilot season. And do you know what that is? Uh, no. Okay, so in, in the film business, there's something called pilot season, and I don't know if it still is but, um, uh, now, but it used to be Jan mostly January where people developed pilots, new, new, new TV shows, and they shot one episode of it to see if they could get it turned in, they could get funded to get a whole series. And so it's called pilot season where everyone's doing pilots of their new show. And so a lot of actors, I mean, LA is crazy. Like LA is just, I mean, did you go to LA? No, but I've been before. It is crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. And especially yeah. if you're, especially if you're in the film and television act, the actor in that business or in the music business, it is a place that is, people come from all over the world and the number of people who are there to make it it's like it's a trope and it's a stereotype wow. and it's so true <laughs> <laughs> so anyway so i went for pilot season thinking oh i'm gonna hate it because i'm like i'm more down to earth than la and la is so <laughs> superficial and, and i just i totally fell in love with california so, <laughs> um so anyway, I ended up staying there and I worked there and I did a bunch of shows there. And then, um, you know, and then I, I worked there until I met my husband and we traveled for a while also in Asia. And then we came back and got married. I got pregnant. And when I got pregnant, I quit the film business. And I think the thing that right now I'm reflecting on that's the most interesting thing is that when I left the film business, I was 30, uh, I guess I was 31 or 32, somewhere in my early 30s. And I, and I knew, and I said that in quotation marks, I thought that, well, if you leave the film business now, that's going to be it for you because mostly there are no parts, good parts for women over 30 anyway. And unless you're Meryl Streep or like some famous person, but, and mostly it was true. Like the, the roles for women in, in that time, that was 19... 98, the early 2000s, like the roles for women were not what they are now. And they, it's changed because there's so much more opportunity for people to create their own content and for people to, you know, make their own, like to people have their own voices heard. There's so many more avenues for distribution, so much more empowerment for people to produce and create their own stories that it's all changed. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that at the time when I left, uh, my being racially ambiguous, mixed race, I made it work. And, you know, at the time there were sometimes roles like the exotic girl, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was in my twenties or thirties and I was, and I could play the exotic mixed race girl. But when I left, I thought, well, that's not going to exist anymore. Well, interestingly, that's changed a lot now too. Mm -hmm. There's, in the film business so anyway it, the interesting thing is i pulled that out because i'm just in the process of re-entering that business and i didn't ever think it would happen because i thought that once i left that would be it for me because because the business was different then and i never expected it to change in the ways it's changed now so ah, yeah cool. so uh, oh, we're I, gonna see you on some cool movies soon nice. <laughs> i don't know i mean i don't know what it's gonna look like and i'm open to what it looks like i think the thing that's been really interesting and god i feel like i'm talking a lot jeez <laughs> <laughs> well you're a guest on this podcast yeah. so. <laughs> what about you, <laughs> um apparently i can talk a lot um <laughs> uh, i think that the thing that's been really interesting for me recently is that you know I am at a new chapter in my life right now and my kids are almost launched and my marriage has transitioned and is ending, you know, and, and, uh, and I'm now in my, I'm 54. So I'm now at a different stage of life. And what I realize now, and I don't say this in any way to take anything away. I loved raising my kids. I being a mother is probably one of the most precious things that I've experienced in my life. 
and I would never change it. But I did spend, like many women my age did, the last couple decades with my focus on supporting other people's needs. And mm. that, in my case, it was supporting my husband's career and uh, raising my kids in building communities of support in the parenting and homeschooling and educational worlds and homeschooling my kids and just like being a spokesperson and an advocate for better learning for gifted kids and for people homeschooling and for creating communities around those things. And so during that period of time, I thought of my performing, performing background as history. I thought, well, that was something I used to do. And now I'm realizing as I discover and remember that life is this spiral that keeps on coming around and we can consistently reinvent and reclaim parts of ourselves. And, you know, we can talk about my experience as a dancer um, at some point because that's been a big part of my recent story. Um, but when I rediscovered that, I, I was reminded of the fact that I'm actually a performer. You know, mm. that's, that's what I am. I've always been a performer. And, and, and I say that with a kind of awe or shock or something in my voice because there was a part of me that for that number of decades really did think that that was historical, you know? And, and now I'm still a little bit in the awe of remembering that it's, wasn't, it's not a closed chapter, that it was a period of time where my attention was elsewhere. But that it's my true nature actually to be a performer. It's my true nature to be on stages. It's my true nature to speak and to share. And now I don't know what it's going to look like, but as I come out and I reclaim my love of performing and being on stages, the big difference is that I know that it's for a different purpose than it used to be. I didn't know, like I left, I left my art studies because I didn't know what my story was. I didn't know what my purpose was. I didn't know, I hadn't experienced enough life to know why in the world I would want to be an artist. You know, mm. and now I have a clear idea of it. So now I have a, I'm coming back into my bringing my presence to and my performance and my love of performing and my process, my love of the process of being an artistic person. But I'm coming back to it with a, with a with a vision of it being in service of you know other stories, mm. you know, being in service of of other missions you know, of other messages, of, of, of supporting uh, change and growth in our mm. culture, in, in freeing people in, from some of the limitations of the, that our cultures put on. But, mm. you know, and so it's almost like all the elements of my life are kind of converging to come together now for something bigger, which is really exciting. Yeah. That's so cool, yeah. That's a theme that we've had lately, isn't it, Gary? <laughs> literally, Greg, I was like, literally, like, our last, like, three guests have literally, like, they, yeah. they've lived these lives and then, you know, done so many, everyone's, like, done so many different things. And then eventually there was this point in their life where everything converged and then the, the bigger picture just came out to them. And, like, it's a, it was just amazing. It's almost like mm. in some magical way, you're manifesting this throughout your whole life. You know what I mean? And it just sort of starts happening. That's, that's been exactly what Craig said. The, the last few guests like that. <laughs> that's amazing. Can you just tell me a little bit about one of them or just like, can, cause I love that I'm part yeah. of a theme that has to do with that. That isn't mm. just my story, but that yeah. is a theme that you're seeing recreating. Cause there's something magical to the mm. themes that just show up on our shows, in our lives, in our mm. conversations. Yeah, yeah it's all intertwined. Yeah. What, yeah. So what's one yeah. story? There, there, there was a guy. So could you want to talk about Wayne or something, Craig? Go for it, bud. Yeah. So so this guy Wayne, we just launched uh, last week. Wayne Kaminsky, South African guy. Like, he he started his life as a designer, um, like a graphic designer. Then he uh, moved into like the web side of things. Like he became a like he taught himself how to code. Um, then he went into the social media side of things. Uh, and then he really became interested in health and, uh, and food and he entered like master chef. And then off the back of that, he basically launched the biggest food service company in South Africa, which creates like uh, these amazing um, uh, meals, like pre pre-made meals, but like they have zero 
uh, artificial ingredients, preservatives, whatsoever. Like literally, um, the the health he reckons the it's the healthiest food kind of uh, service or home delivery service in the world because they use no artificial stuff in their food whatsoever. But his convergence was these things. So now he it was his love for food, and he knew how to uh, you know how to design and create like great looking. Um, I guess like a, a website, he could design his own websites and, and, and all these other things. And he was really into his sports and stuff too. So he was catering for a certain bunch of people, you know, and it was just, yeah, all these things came together, you know, and like, and, and he was also an entrepreneur actually, like as in terms of a freelancer throughout that whole journey. And then he just like came and he built this epic company, which he now runs in South Africa. So. Oh my God. I love that so much. I just, but a layer that. to that story, you know, is, is that it's a, a lot of tough times, you know, he wasn't yeah. well, he was, mm. he, you know, and these things from, you know, at the time you, you don't always realize like, this is tough. I don't get it. And, and that's another thing to remember. And also time, mm. you know, you can't go back 10 years and say, I should have done it then. Because it just, as you said, Lisa, like your life is just through one way or another, it's, it's come, there's a confluence of things now. And, and it's, it's so cool. It gives, I think it's a real hopeful thing because people don't maybe always necessarily know where things are going, but you just know you're accruing all this life experience and skills and things. And, and if you have just an inkling of like this vision of for yourself, it, it will come together, you know, and I think that's, that's definitely happening for you now, which is really epic. Yeah, totally. I think you're exactly right on to something that people can trust mm. a little bit, but you don't always in the moment trust it because when you're right in the moment of your life, you can't always have the perspective. You don't have the forward vision perspective and you don't even necessarily see how the past fits together. And that's something that's really beautiful and the gift of getting older is that you have that much more time and that many more hills and valleys and cycles and spirals to look at and to have perspective on. And so, I mean, it's harder to see when you're in the midst of one chapter, how that fits in to the larger convergence, you know, how all those pieces are going to converge together. And so I think it's really, it's something that I work with on um, people in my program. I have a program called Artful Aging. And it's something that I'm really, you know, that I key in with people is that one of the benefits of being older and one of the ways that we can really be empowered in how we age is to see how all those pieces come together and have different processes for looking at it. Actually, one of them is I call um, the triple threat, using your triple threat, which is what are the three things that you're good at? And if they were to form together, kind of like the, your guest that you just mentioned, if you have mm -hmm. an entrepreneurial background and you have a marketing background and you know how to do websites and you know food, wow, how can you, how can you, you might, you might not be the best, you know, foodie in the whole world, but you might be the best foodie who also has marketing skill and, mm -hmm. you know, website development and entrepreneurial knowledge. And, you know, I forget there was another interesting piece that he had. Um, graphic design. Oh, health and graphic, health. Yeah. 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 And then the health components, you know, yeah. so, you yeah. know, yeah, it's really cool. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's awesome. I love that. That's cool that you're doing that. It's, it's nice to give people uh, just a, number one, be the example. And number two, like say, look, you know, the, the, just, these are some ways to look at life through a certain lens. And, and that I think you'll definitely be helping people that way. That's for sure. And what I also liked what you said is that we often think, okay, chapter one, chapter two, looking forward, but I like the circuit. Like you can go back to a new, yeah, that circuit. I really like that. It's, it's not just linear one way. The, the life is so like, you know, so connected in different ways as well so you can go back to a career that's really cool and and look you have been you've always been like trying new things as you mentioned reinventing and then and then like 2000 you and your husband um had a had a, a hardware tech business together um and and both of you were were not really enjoying it actually and and then you decided to leave acting and become a, a coach after you read a book called coach you by thomas leonard isn't it yeah yeah yeah, I mean, that's, um, you know, now this is just like you say, we have the spiral, right? So we go up and then we change and then we go back down and then we move around. And so life is definitely like that. It's not a linear, it's not a linear pathway. So I love that our conversations like that too, because that's a little bit going back in time, but it's really, it's really, um, 
you know, it's really a relevant one because it was, it was the transition for me from, from acting. It was the transition into that period of time that was my family chapter, you know, it was, and it was, um, you know, 1998 was uh, like quite a year for me and that it's a year that I can look back and I can tell you that um, I went traveling around Asia with my soon to be husband. We planned a wedding. We got married, we got pregnant. I went through a whole pregnancy. I left acting. I went into the business that you're talking about. I joined him in his art, in his hardware uh, business. He was designing um, uh, test equipment for the hard disk industry in 2000 during the height of the dot com industry. Uh, I moved twice in away from a place where I lived by myself when I was an independent film and television actor. So I went from being a film and television actor living by myself in Los Angeles in Topanga Canyon to you know traveling, getting married, getting pregnant moving, joining a hardware business, leaving acting, giving birth. And, you know, like it was just an insane year. And it was shocking in the sense of um, revising my self-concept. You know, it was Mm. a really big self-concept shift. And at the time it was a hard one and it wasn't one that I wanted to give up because I, you know, loved having my kids and I was, you know, in a, in the, like, very beginning of this marriage that lasted 20 years and um but it was a really big shock in terms of my self-identity in the world Mm -hmm. and um and at the time i didn't have the perspective on it there was i remember you know nursing my my baby um and just thinking oh my god what have i done to my life you know (laughs) the reality is that your kids grow up so fast you know, and here I am sitting there thinking, okay, I guess I'm going to be sitting here nursing for the rest of my life. What have I done? <laughs> you know, it's like you don't have perspective. It's like you're, you're reptilian, you know, kind of, yeah. have you ever done things where you're like climbing and you're strapped in to something like bungee jumping or like you're trying to, you know, you're strapped in and, and you know, intellectually that you can walk out on that tightrope and if you fall, the, the thing will catch you. <laughs> or once you jump off the bungee jump, it's going to catch you. But your brain is like, no way. <laughs> you know, like it's, it was kind of yeah. like that. It was like my intellectual brain knew, oh, yeah, like nursing doesn't last forever. But there was this part of me that was like, oh, my God, this is my new life. What have I done? <laughs> you know? yeah, were, you, yeah, were you scared or like, were you, were you like or, or anxious about it? Or oh, was there a feeling? I was I was scared. I didn't know I knew how to do it. I, I don't think there's enough credence or enough talking about the shock it is to become a parent. I mean, the way, the degree to which it changes your life. You know, mm. don't get me wrong. I, I tell my kids, like, I hope you have kids. It's like the, it's like the most transformative, you know, deep, powerful thing there is. Um, you know, not, not that everyone should do it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know, I have a lot of friends who get upset when women say that, but or other people say that because maybe you don't want to have kids, or maybe you can't have kids, or. But you know, for me, um, it's a gift to have kids, and it's transformative. But the reality is that we don't talk enough about how shocking the transition into being a parent is. Mm. It's really, really shocking, and it's and especially for me, like like I just said, I was living by myself in Los Angeles, working in film and television you know, as an actor and, you know, you get treated really well when you're an actor and you're like, get all this privilege and you're treated special and all that. Just suddenly I was like clean, dirty diapers with, and then, you know, you go out and you're like, oh, what do you do? Well, I have this baby, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and people are like, oh, let's see if there's no one else like inter- more interesting I can talk to. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> well, I used to be, I used to be that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting how we like, we sort of, yeah, we, we create these identities for ourselves and we, we, you know, we, we want to be seen by them, I guess, in some sort of way sometimes. Um, but you know, just to, you, you, you just spoke about a crazy year there. I, th- I don't know when it happened or if it was the same sort of year, but you basically decided to sell everything. Uh, you know, the company, you bought yourself an RV, which is like a big, uh, sort of, uh, transport vehicle basically and then you you started coaching in the back of it didn't you and and you you moved to san fran or you got to san fran or something and then you you lived across the road from where your husband 
uh, at the time was like, you know, involved in a startup. I mean, it's oh my God. Uh, talk about deep that information. Where did you get that? It's so funny. I'm, in Canada, there used to be this talk show called the Brian Linehan show. And he used to do so much research on his guests and the famous thing they'd always get on. And they'd say, you really do your research. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, do you know where you got that piece of information from? Do you happen to remember? Or no? Yes. I don't know. I listened to quite a few podcasts and looked on a lot, lot of websites and uh, yeah, so I, I can't remember which one, but <laughs> Okay, so I, I realized I didn't answer when Craig asked me just now, gave me that intro into what happened, and I kind of I got a little sidelined on it. But yeah, I, I joined the, my husband's business with him. I had a newborn baby. I went into the office every day with him because the idea of staying home with a baby by myself was just a, like it created anxiety in me. I was like, I don't, it was just such a different radical like shift in my self identity and perspective and it was scary you know mm -hmm. so i went into to his office with him and i joined the business and you know and it, it wasn't a business that he was that was aspirational enough for him and it certainly wasn't a business that was making use of my best skills you know i was running bombs which are bill of materials you know calling up disc drive companies and you know like chip companies like do you have part number six five four available? How much is it? You know, <laughs> when's it going to be creative available? Creative woman. Yes, right. <laughs> it was not like the best use of my skills. So um, there was a certain level of dissatisfaction. I think we both felt, and because um, I am a seeker and a you know learner, and I came across this book that you mentioned called Coach You by Thomas Leonard. It was the very beginning of the coach life and life coaching um, era. So I think he wrote that book around 1998 or 1999. I read it in 2000. And he talked about how he started this business coaching and he helped people and he had some skill sets and he had a program and he happened to live in an RV. And I was like, oh my God, there it is. There's the answer. You know, I love traveling. I felt stifled. My husband really wanted to move back to San Francisco where the tech industry was and I really didn't, I didn't like San Francisco at that time at all. I loved LA and I really didn't want to do that, but I could be convinced to move into an RV, start a coaching <laughs> business, take our kid along and travel around the States. I had this vision of, you know, parking our RV on tops of beautiful hills and coaching people from there and, you know, seeing new things and traveling. And so we bought this RV, we sold everything, we let our employees go and we, um, moved our six, our kid was 16 months old at the time, moved us all in and we made our first stop in San Francisco and we did not leave. My husband um, started meeting with people around uh, the startup he was um, creating, which was, uh, turned out, ended up being the company that had the world's smallest Windows operating computer mm. and did really well until the iPhone came out in 2008 or 2008 so they were doing great but anyway that, that's like a sideline to the story the real part of the story that's relevant is that we got stopped in san francisco he started to build that team and one week turned into three and one month turned into four months and finally after three or four months i was like i don't think we're leaving are we so we we did we parked it outside of the startup uh warehouse where the startup was and um, we lived in the RV for about 13 months. Our kid was, when we got there, our kid was 16 months old. We started, I started a childcare co-op with a bunch of other families I met and we all met each other's houses. So our day was in our RV. And um, yeah, we lived there for 13 months. And then finally, you know, since we were not, clearly not going anywhere, um, I found a place that I really liked living in the San Francisco Bay area. Found a house there and you know, now I've lived in this area for, 15 years and now i actually love it so <laughs> <laughs> that's good <laughs> it's changed a lot since then though i have to say the bay area the san francisco bay area has changed a lot since 2000 in yeah, the last yeah. 19 years so. yeah and the, oh, the rv day <laughs> what's that 19 years i lived here wow. wow well the rv day was everyone's favorite day when they had to come to your day that i Sweet, we go get to sit in the RV. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The kids were little. I'm sure they probably. You know. And so, just talking a little bit about you know about the coaching side, like what what kind of coaching were you doing? And um, but but it's also like something that many coaches struggle with is is sort of not being able to make coaching a sustainable business. Um, and you sort of struggled with a little bit with that too, didn't you? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, the thing is, I didn't have the language for it at the time. Now it's what people call scalable, right? It just wasn't scalable. And yeah. I, I just, you know, I'd worked as a film and TV actor, and I was used to making a lot of money when I was working and then having a bunch of periods of time where I wasn't working. And then I loved coaching, and I felt like I was really good at it, and I loved making a difference in people's lives. And my focus was very much on helping people make their lives and their work be aligned with who they were personally now which is a common thing at the time it was really kind of unusual in fact coaching was really unusual then in fact mm -hmm. i would go to business networking networking groups and say i was a life and business coach and or i'd say i was a coach and people would be like soccer or you know <laughs> soccer. like people just didn't know what coaching was then it was a little bit early uh, now, you know, some of my friends and colleagues at the time who were early in coaching, like when I was around that time, now they've been coaching 19 years and mm. they're working, you know, they're doing amazing things. They're, they're brilliant. They're doing, yeah, they're just doing great. They stuck in it. But for me, it just wasn't a model that I felt like I knew how to do in a sustainable way that was scalable because it always felt like it was going to be time for money and um, sales so far hasn't been my really best mm. skill. And I don't, and at the time, the amount that you could charge for coaching wasn't that much. And, you know, and that was sort of my thinking at the time. So I left and I went into creating a training organization with um, some other coaches for the next four or five years. Uh, but now actually what I realize now is I look back on it and I go back to the story I told you earlier where I see all these convergences is that my real ability is actually not one-to-one, -one. even though I love one-to-one -one and I learn a lot from one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm really more of a one-to-many person, hmm. you know, whether it's stages or podcasts or film or speaking, you know, I think I can be more effective and I think I can contribute what I want to contribute to the world more effectively doing a one-to-many model rather than a one-on-one, -on -one. even though I love the connection and the, you know, the personal connection with people. 100% like literally uh, Craig and I were having this conversation I think this week even uh, and I, I was saying the exact same thing to him I was like you know because I also work as a coach but I was like I I even though it's great one-on-one -on -one, I totally feel like more in my elements when it's like you know group coaching sort of environment and like you said it's about it comes down to sort of the impact you can make and you know, that's a different type of energy that you bring, you know, and I think it's a different type of energy when you're with a group of people as opposed to one-on-one. -on -one. And I totally know exactly what you mean. So I literally have the exact same thoughts. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, so talking about like groups of people and these sort of things, you know, like obviously uh, teaching is a passion for yours, you know, and development is like something that's like in your bones and you've, homeschooled uh, your kids uh, and I know you don't necessarily like the word homeschooling you mentioned it in one of your other podcasts um, and you've also like uh, created a very large network of four over 400 families um, that do educate their kids in the Bay Area so where do you think this kind of passion came from for wanting to homeschool your own kids well it goes back to what I said earlier that I didn't have a good experience educationally and that I really wanted to maintain and nurture a love of learning and individualized and um, customized learning for kids because I think ideally that's what everyone should have and I um, so I'm just going to check this make sure it's still recording one sec yeah it's good uh, and so that was my experience and I didn't want that for my kids I wanted my kids to be engaged I would want that for all kids but I knew that I couldn't do it for all kids, but I could do it for my kids. Mm -hmm. And so I imagined this experience of homeschooling. So we started that. My, my older kid went to school for a couple of years and then we left to homeschool. And I am a community oriented person and I didn't see myself. And I'm actually, just to clarify one thing, I actually am not a great teacher. And I, in terms of like sitting down with a person one-on-one. -on -one. And so the reason why I don't call it homeschooling is because, like I say, we didn't stay home much and we weren't creating school at home. So when people hear homeschooling, what they think of is there's a mom sitting at the kitchen table with a math textbook and we're wow. opening it to page 14 and doing page. And now we're going to close it because now it's time for language arts. That's what we call school at home. And I did not do that because I wasn't interested in recreating school. I wanted something different for my kids. And I'm a community-oriented person. And so 
I formed that group with a friend, it was actually her idea, to bring people together face to face in the Bay Area who were homeschooling for the reasons we were, which was to keep learning the love of learning alive in high ability kids who were generally also quite asynchronous, which means that if you test high in IQ scores, you often are low in other areas. So you could have a very wide range. You might be, you might be 10 years ahead in your math arithmetic skills than you are saying your spelling skills, mm -hmm. something like that. So anyway, unique learners. And we wanted to create an environment and a community of people who could collaborate and also who could understand this idea of raising what we call gifted kids because like I said earlier, I referenced that when you say, well, my kid's gifted and you really are wanting to talk about the unique challenges that come with a kid like that, because there are, like what kind of books do you get a kid who can read at a high school level, but really has no life experience or the ability to process you know, complicated emotions? What, what books do you give this kid? Like mm -hmm. that and many, many more things. And we wanted to create an environment where people could be free to talk about the unique experiences they had for their kids and with their kids but also in a way that could support and nurture and be a safe space to celebrate what the kids' abilities were and what was possible with them, where they didn't have to feel like they were always kind of talking behind closed doors because someone else might feel offended that they were implying that their kid was better than theirs or something like that, you know? Um, so we formed that group and, um, and what that became was a central connection point for other families in the San Francisco Bay Area connecting with each other to create collaborative learning opportunities, which has always been my thing. So I'm really good at finding people who are amazing, finding people who are great teachers and passionate about a topic, who I can identify, you know, skilled, you know, presence and special ability in that area. And I'm really good at bringing people together and creating structures for communities. So my kids pretty much always, and what I encouraged in my group was that everyone else organize opportunities like that for the kids. Hmm. So people will put together learning days or they find an amazing entomologist and they'd have a class for a couple hours on a Tuesday and that would be followed by a writing class that was based around Harry Potter and then another class that was, so creating alternatives to school that were community-based. Hmm. So I say all that to say that the basic responses. I'm not really a very good teacher. In fact, I'm not a really good teacher at all when it comes to academic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic. I don't know if so, I, so, I, I went off so long, I don't even know if I answered your question. <laughs> no, that's cool. We did. <laughs> this is really fascinating. You know, like this, you know, education is changing so much. And I think like, is that a, is that, is that model? Is that something that has been repeated or you um, sort of pioneers in that sort of model or like it's it's really fascinating I'm sure people listening to this would be like oh maybe they would love to be involved with something like that or is it only you know your model was it only for gifted in inverted commas kids or well our group happens to be but they're all different yeah. groups with different premises I mean they're Christian homeschooling groups and they're unschooling groups unschooling is a, a process or a practice yeah. and an approach to schooling where you really let the kids completely self-guide and there's a spectrum some people are radical unschoolers where they let the kids do anything they want all times and other people who are more what they call eclectic homeschoolers and so they're all different groups um, I do believe maybe incorrectly but I do believe that our group is pretty trailblazing if not the only group that does mm. things, things like this and I think that we have been an example and um, of the type of learning that I think is becoming more common as time goes by and as uh, outside, you know, independent, I call it independent learning, by the way, not homeschooling, because uh. we're, we're learning in our community, independent and community learning. Uh, because basically it. as a family, we're designing what's appropriate for kids and get making sure their needs are met in, in my case, in the context of some community. But the beauty of independent learning is you create it for meeting the needs of your family and your kids. And there's, in certain countries, not in all countries, but certainly in some of our countries, there's the possibility of doing that. Um, you know, other countries, it's illegal. Other countries don't have the resources. You know, there's all kinds of limitations mm -hmm. to it. But yeah. Um, and, and the other thing I'd expand on in answer to your question, Craig, is that um, there's some limitations to to the type of learning that I'm describing, and that is that 
not all places are as rich in resources as the San Francisco Bay Area is. We also have so many families doing it that we have the ability to create amazing communities. And not all places in the world have that same richness. Mm. And so there are some challenges. There can be challenges to going outside of brick and mortar, regular traditional schooling, and that is it can be isolated. Even in our case, even with as many families as we have, the kids still don't have the same regularity of a common cohort every single day. And so one of the things I see changing now is this advent, this uh, uprising in um, incidents of what I call micro schools. And that's schools that, it used to be the option was you homeschool or you eat the whole elephant and send your kids to public school where they have to go hand them over, they have to be there nine to four every single day, they have to do the same thing everyone else does every single day, there's no options, there's no customizability, nothing. And you either had one or the other. And people would be like, well, I can't educate my kids, I can't independently, I can't, I've got to work or, or, and on the other hand, independent schoolers would be like, well, I wish my kids could take music and physics, but I really would rather they're learning, you know, mm -hmm. literature at home. But you didn't have that option. You had to do one or the other. So micro schools are starting to be an option in many places, certainly in the U.S. and certainly in the Bay Area, where there's a la carte classes and you can pick and choose on the basis of a class for one or two days. And there's a space that people can come to where there's a shared environment. So I think it's a really, I did actually a talk called The Future of Learning as Micro Schools. Um, on my innovative education conference a few years ago. And it talks about the fact that I think that's something that's really growing. So, mm, yes. yeah. Okay. We actually spoke to Seth Godin uh, on our podcast, and he also mentions like. Uh, you did? Yeah. Good yeah. Seth Godin on your podcast? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> I have to listen, go back and listen to that one. I missed that yeah. one. You spoke a little bit about education, and you were just saying, you know, like what's so cool these days is that, you know, you can have literally the, the best at something, you know, or like let's say maths or whatever, like one of the best teachers in the world that can give you a class, and then you can have like the teacher or the parent or whatever, then just sort of making sure that you've listened and watched and, and taken stuff home from it. But we don't live in a world where you have to necessarily have an average math teacher because you're at that school teaching your kids math. You can have the best in the world. And I really like that sort of thinking. And that's kind of what you're saying. You can go to the whoever in that city and just find like one of the top people and get them. And it's, it just makes so much sense. And what are, what are some of maybe just some of, you know, some of the other small benefits of, of homeschooling and also, um, you know, you actually, Can I actually just jump on what you just said. I just want to add in and it sort of will answer the question as you're asking it now to another example. So hmm. what you just said about the fact that you don't have to have just your average teacher, you can actually, you know, learn from some of the best. Mm. It, a number of months ago, I interviewed a homeschooled kid who I met, I think I, I actually think I heard him on a podcast, and his name is Noah Tetzner, and he is now, at the time, I think he was 16 when I interviewed him, and he'd been homeschooled for a year or two. He basically said to his family that he was really passionate about history, and he doesn't want to go to school anymore. He just wants to study history, and so they let him go home, like come home and not, not go to school. So he did. So what did he do? He started a podcast. Hmm. And... And his podcast was all about medieval history. And so through the process of running his podcast, he learned, as you know, a whole bunch of different technical skills, a bunch of marketing skills, a lot of communication skills. And he got to go dig deep into his passion, which was medieval history. Hmm. And so what he did was he spent all his time on his podcast interviewing the top scholars in all the top universities at Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and on medieval history. And so like what better way is there to learn yeah. <laughs> your topic than, you know, here's a kid who could be sitting in grade 10 history in some local high school, mm. you know, learning from around a bunch of kids who are bored out of their heads. Or you can be self-driven and self-directed and interviewing the top people in the field of interest. You know, like, I think that's so such, cool. a, yeah, such yeah. a convergence of the possibilities of education and our world of podcasting. <laughs> very cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I, love, I really love the concept of um, homeschooling and then also what you spoke about now around micro-schooling and also the community-based stuff as well. It's, uh, 
it's such a great mix, you know what I mean? And um, it's, it's really actually super exciting. And, and we've actually spoken to quite a few, well, like a handful of homeschooled uh, kids on our podcast and they've just been the brightest uh, kids around, you know what I mean? Like they, there's, I think it's the, it's also the EQ. I don't know. They have a different EQ as well. So it was, uh, you know, it was just, it's just really fascinating, like speaking to them. It's uh, loved it. I think part of it is that they've been around, they haven't been siloed into the same age category. Yeah. And some, if you're basically raised and socialized by exactly your peers within mm. six or eight months of yourself, you don't get a very broad experience around how to interact and on different ideas. And yeah. everyone's at the same time in the period of time when they're trying to blend in or they're trying to not stand out. And so that's what mm. you're acculturated around. Whereas mm. if you're homeschooled, you're much more likely to get exposure to adults and to younger kids and to yeah. take care of little kids and to have you know interactions with older people. And so you have a much broader exposure to the world, I think, which gives you, you know, a more, more perspective. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 you know, talking about learning and just, just kind of moving on just a little bit, you, you're never too old to learn. Like, I think that's the cool thing and for us to all realize. And six years ago, you were walking past the ballroom studio and you saw these young Latin dancers in there and you were like, <laughs> I want to be with those people. I want to be part of it. <laughs> and Did then you get that from my rebranding aging talk? Did you watch my rebranding aging talk? Is that where you got that story? Uh, I, I I can't remember. Like I've I've watched quite a lot of them, so I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> but uh, um, and and then I know it took you like it took you eight months to actually go and join a class. I'm sure maybe you're just fearful, whatever the story was. And but then you did, and then you decided a year, year later. Okay, cool. I'm going to enter competition. So what was that like for you? Yeah, yeah. I think you must have gotten that from the rebranding aging talk at the women's at women's speak festival. Because yes, I tell that story on the fact that when I was my kids were getting older and I could see the fact that they were going to be you know, moving on. And I saw this approaching empty nest and I thought, I don't want to be that mom that's holding on to the kids. You know, don't leave, mm. don't leave. I'm so invested in you. And I knew I wanted something else to put my attention on. And I'd always loved dance. And I did walk past the studio in my neighborhood. And I'm exactly like you described, just like in, have you ever seen the movie Shall We Dance with Richard? Mm. There's two versions of it, the Japanese one and a, Richard Gere, Jay Lopez. No, I don't anyway, <laughs> he, he's coming home from his boring accounting job and he's riding the train and he looks down from the train tracks into this dance studio and he sees Jennifer Lopez doing the tango. You know, and, um, and I had kind of a moment like that where I looked at these kids and they were unbelievable. And I didn't know it at the time, but they were, they were only 13, 14, 15 years old, but they were high level competitive dancers. like nationally placing competitive Latin dancers. And of course it was ridiculous. I'm looking at them going, oh my God, whatever that is, I gotta do that. That looks so amazing. It was so, I was totally enthralled. And so yeah, I went in to the studio and I asked all the questions and about the classes and and I ended up, uh, the story is like, you might remember, the story that I tell is I bought a card of 10 lessons and I didn't use it for, until it was almost gonna expire. <laughs> and then I, I then so I forced myself to go back and I forced myself to pick a class and and I was telling the story in that talk about how part of my fear or part of the thing that kept me was this belief system that is in the back of my head I don't think I was even conscious of it that was like oh you're too old to do that that's a sexy dance that's that's physically challenging that's for young people. They all start when they're five years old. You're 49. No way. Too old, too late. <laughs> and because the card was going to expire, though, I went and I took the class. And I did. I just fell completely in love with it. I just loved it so much. And, yeah, and I, and I, got, and I got really involved in it. I started taking a lot of classes. I trained. And then one of my teachers said to me, you know what? You should compete. And <laughs> he happened to say that to me about – two weeks after I had set the intention at my end of year planning that next year I'm going to compete. I don't know what it's going to take, but next year I'm going to compete. <laughs> so when he said that to me, it was like, oh my God, I cannot believe you said that. I am in, where do I sign up? Let's get going. <laughs> and so I really intensely trained for the next three months and I did my first competition about three months later and it was so fun. And I just, I loved it. And I'm, and I'm not competing in that dance form anymore. And I really miss it. Um, 
And, you know, at some point I might go back to it, but it just was such a fun experience. And it really was uh, transformative for me in realizing that there are those self-imposed limitations we all put on ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And these stories that we say, well, oh, I'm too old to do that. Or, and that, um, you know, I, and, I, and the interesting thing is someone asked me a couple of days ago, um, how I came to realizing that I'm so committed to this rebranding aging and artful aging and retelling the story. And I was like, I don't know. I mean, I like dancing and I did this dance and then I won this world title when I was 52 and it was really exciting and it was cool. And, and I think what happened as I thought through it was that um, I had it reflected back to me. I was just doing my thing and every once in a while I would post a video of my dance and I feel a little sheepish about it, but I posted on Facebook anyway. And I'd be like, well, it's not, you know, I'm, I just only been dancing for three years, but here's the last competition I did. And, you know, and kind of sheepishly, but then I kept getting so much feedback from people that was like, wow, that's amazing. I'm so inspired. Oh my God, you're inspired. You know, I got that feedback from people and that was, healing and encouraging and informative for me to realize because you know how sometimes when you do what you just do mm. you don't really recognize that it's having an impact or you don't know that it has an impact mm. you know you don't know that you're making a difference until someone says thank you so much for doing that because it made a difference mm. in my life and you're putting yourself on on a limb like that made me realize that i can do it too mm. And so it was really in the having that reflected from other people that I realized that, oh, maybe there's a story in this and maybe it's a story that can be useful to other people. Mm. Mm. So powerful. What a super inspiring, I must say, like just, just, you know, just thinking about it as well, even just from a male perspective, I think, you know, typically lots of men don't dance or, you know, as much. And I think part of it is exactly what you're saying is like a limiting belief. You go, oh, that's not a, that's not a male thing to do. Like I, I, I think it would be fun to try, but I, there's a part of me that goes, Oh no, that's like, <laughs> I would look ridiculous. I'm too manly, you know, whatever it is. And it's just yeah. another limiting belief, even from, from, a, from that perspective, but it's so super inspiring. And but look, um, we, we, you know, time's marching on here, but I, I would love to just tell us a little bit about your, your podcast. Cause this is something you brought up and obviously this is part of how we met and it's so exciting. Um, and you, you know, you, 85 episodes in um so yeah tell us a bit about what what you talk about who you speak to and and how the experience has been for you yeah wow well it's been amazing i love podcasts i'm just such a i mean i i love podcasts i listen to i think in my i probably have like 50 like subscribed you know in my in my podcast addict and i love so many shows i especially love tim ferris i love michael gervais finding mastery I loved all these shows that were mostly hosted by men and had a pretty high percentage of men, male guests. And now I might, I launched my podcast in November, 2017. So when I was really deeply falling in love with podcasts, it was a couple of years ago. And, and honestly, I'm going to say that even in the last couple of years, I feel this has changed, but, or maybe I just know about so many other, you know, podcasts that host women and have women as, as guests and are run by, run by women. But at the time, I felt like I didn't hear the female voice so much. And so I thought, wow, I'd love to have a, a show like Tim Ferriss's, but maybe that, that interviews more women. He interviews about 8% men and 20% women, it seems like to me. So I thought, oh, okay, well, look. <laughs> like I, of course, I, there's so many amazing men. I want to interview. I don't want it to just, someone had suggested, why don't you just interview women? It can be a woman's podcast. And I really mm. didn't want to do that because I want the voice of men too. It's really important mm. and powerful to have male perspective on life and on the things I'm interested in. But I thought, oh, there needs to be more women. So I kind of committed to myself. I'd have 80% women, 20% men. And I basically do long form interviews, not as long as yours, <laughs> but I usually aim for like 45 minutes um, with really amazing women about the superpower behind their success. And usually I start with something from their childhood that informs who they've become. And then we talk about how they're, what they're doing in the world now. And at a certain point, I tell them my context for superpower, which I see as being that skill set or that strength or that inclination that's been with you your entire life that is so natural to you that it's like the water you swim in or the air you breathe. 
and that is so natural to you because of that, that you almost don't recognize it as anything special, but to other people, it looks like they're scaling a vertical hill. And that's, you know, you might not even know that you have it or you possessed it until many people have reflected it back to you. And I put that out because I'd ask your listeners to say, you know, what's your superpower if you look at it from that context? It's the thing that's been the through line of your life. And it doesn't matter, like in my case, whether I was acting or whether I was running homeschooling classes or groups or whether I was coaching or whether I'm creating communities. It's what's the thing that's always been there as a strength. For me, it's bringing people and ideas together, connecting ideas and connecting people. Mm-hmm. And usually in the conversation with, the pers- with people I can usually identify or in collaboration with them, can identify that one thing for them. And I think it's important for them and powerful that for them to identify because when we identify something, we can actually use it more effectively. Mm-hmm. And for my listeners, I think it's great for them to reflect on what theirs is, but also to be inspired by the learning and the generalizable knowledge from my guests. And so, yeah, it's been amazing. I love it. It's a lot of work, as you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but so it's so fun. So what's your superpower, Lisa? My superpower is uh, connecting ideas and people. Okay, cool. Mm. Yeah, yeah, what's yours? I, I can't remember. I'm trying to remember what we called yours. I think I said something around like listening or networking to something around that. I can't remember exactly, but it was, it was, yeah. Craig, what was yours? Do you remember, bud? Curiosity, I think. Curiosity. It was. Oh, yeah, yeah, listening, maybe. We both kind of mentioned those, like those are things yeah. we've been trying to cultivate. And I think yeah. we still, we still yeah. do. Yeah, 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 totally, totally. Yeah, I think um, I called your episode being ridiculously human because it was yeah. hard to find one superpower <laughs> that was specific, you know, to to just you. Yes, you yeah. Know, to, to, yeah. To you and to try because you're the only people I've ever I've ever interviewed where I interviewed two people, and plus it was like you say the very first time that I've done a live <laughs> it, live conversation, so we didn't go through necessarily uh-huh. the exact same. Uh, yeah. That's format that no, was great though and, yeah. and two men obviously you know, that's so that yeah. great <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was no it was great you're, you're a great host that's for sure yeah. so yeah congrats for for putting together such a good show and and something that really speaks to a, a community you know and really mm-hmm. really helps people and provides a lot of value and like you said a lot of work goes into it and um you know seriously a great great amount of respect for for everything that you do and thank you mm-hmm. for doing that too um, so just before Craig asked you our, our last question, um, you know, like maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what you're excited about, about the future. And maybe you can just also t- touch on, I know you, you sort of, uh, you talk about becoming just more vocal in general about like your thoughts and your feelings and stuff. And something which you've sort of embraced uh, more recently is like, you know, you, you, you said, okay, cool. I'm just going to let my, my gray hair grow and uh, I'm going to embrace my fifties and live, live, you know, live, um, you know, just as like a, you know, experiencing my fifties well, you know, not kind of like hide away from it. Um, and then, you know, so, so just tie that in with what you're kind of doing about your future and then how people can get in, get in touch with you. Yeah. My, my primary commitment, I made a commitment to myself and actually have this ring that symbolizes my commitment to spending a year changing the narrative on how our culture sees aging. And I believe that one of the most underutilized resources is people 50 and older. And I would be going to say specifically women even more so because there's been um, a lot, most, a lot of times women are the ones that have been doing the child raising, been doing the unpaid work. And so there's, you know, a cultural narrative that says, that doesn't, hasn't necessarily celebrated the impact of that and certainly hasn't recognized it in a lot of different ways. And so there's a lot of women out there who have this amazing ability to contribute so much wisdom, so much experience, experience from before they had kids and you know before they, they spent those, that time. And then they come out the other side of it and because we have this cultural narrative of, well, once you're this age, it's all downhill from there, um, that it's an underutilized resource that just needs a little bit of lifting up and a little bit of rebranding. So my mm. current commitment is to changing the way that our culture sees aging and to recognize that if we can change that story and see the power of reinvention that exists for people um, who are willing to take on aging as an artful practice and what I'm calling artful aging, um, that we can have huge impact and we can live these vibrant lives for this next bunch of decades. You know, medical science is giving us 
many more decades of vibrant living than we've ever had before as biotech you know contributes to curing age-related diseases and you know there's not i mean that's a whole other topic we could go into all the ways that that's happening but you know it's not inc inconceivable that your generation will live to be many of you will live to be 100. so if we're still mm -hmm. living with this notion that 50 is old or that once your kids are grown and raised you're kind of done and there's nothing left to do but sit and watch netflix you know we're missing out on a lot of opportunity for ourselves and for contributing to the world so i've developed this model on, on, around artful aging that has the premise the basic four premises which are acceptance of what is true and reinvention of what's possible and rebranding which means telling the stories and news so that we can all see the new possibilities and then gracious acceptance and surrender to what isn't changeable mm -hmm. and um, so i'm developing an online course i have a group coaching uh, program that first going to do its first launch in October of this year. I'm not sure when you're going to publish, but October, November will be the first take on the group coaching program. And then next year, I'm going to do an artful aging conference. Um, in the meantime, I'm basically speaking on stages wherever I can to create this message and to share this message of the possibility of rebranding aging and talking a lot about that on my podcast and finding people who are willing to, um, to share their skill sets and their knowledge around how to really live a vibrant life. And as far as the gray hair thing goes, you know, at a certain point when I was developing my rebranding aging talk, I realized that one of the things that can make us grow old, that keeps us from living a vibrant, youthful life as we age, is this idea of ossifying. And that's when you're trying to stay the same. That's mm. actually growth and change that allows us to live vibrantly. And yeah. I realized that, oh, it would be an interesting ritual and experience for me if I took away one piece of that. Like, what is dyeing my hair? You know, sometimes it's for fun. I've dyed it blue and red and all that stuff. But there's symbolically this piece, for me, I'm not saying it's for anybody else, mm. where keeping my hair the same color it was when I was young, in some ways, is getting stuck in an old. Mm. And I thought, okay, well, what happens if I let my hair grow in naturally and I and I rebrand what that means. And I say, this is, you know, I call it being openly gray, um, which is a tick out. I don't know if that's a statement. So you guys like people say openly gay, you know, <laughs> openly gray. And, um, you know, and grand gray, you might not know this, but there's a, there's a look of hair that's where you have two tone hair and they call it ombre, where you have like brown and then at the ends it's blonde, it's called ombre. So I call this grand gray. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of amazing people on Instagram, women, you know, they go by the identifier of silver sisters and, um, and other things. And it's basically what we're saying, hey, let's take back what this means. It, you, it's always been cool for men to be gray. Hey, it's sophisticated. Yeah, but man. for women, it's been like letting yourself go. And I think there's a number of us who are saying, we're going to change the story on that. Cool. <laughs> I love it. So great. <laughs> Really it's cool. such a great pattern interrupt too for for people's thinking and for yourself it's really wonderful and let me just say and both of us will agree on this you're looking great and and just so well and and it's it's really great to see you know it's it's you just look like you're embracing it so much which is epic and so um, maybe you can just tell uh, tell uh, our listeners where you know where we can contact you and find out about your podcast and your your um programs yeah. So I put mostly everything at lisabl.com. I can be found uh, by on all the podcast platforms as Superpower U, and that's the letter U. So it's a take on the university education sort of crossover. Mm -hmm. I have a Facebook group called Superpower U, which promotes the episodes. And so if people are Facebook users, that's a great place to follow me. Uh, to follow me personally is Instagram. And on Instagram, I'm Lisa BL. And I also have Artful Aging is another place that you can look for me online. And um, yeah, and for the coaching programs and the Artful Aging programs, most of them are on my website too. So yeah, that's Beautiful. the best place. Cool. That's really awesome. Well, we put a lot of like show notes together. So all your stuff will be in there for eternity, which is really cool. Um, so, so maybe you can just tell us uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I saw that and I was like, okay, Lisa, get your answer down. And I just, so we're just gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do impromptu here. Mm -hmm. To me, I would say ridiculously human. Being ridiculously human means embracing and accepting the complexity of being a delicate human in the world. That means that we recognize our authentic pain 
and the grief and loss that's a natural part of being human, that the more we can shine light on those shadow sides and on the, the things that are difficult in the world, the more opportunities we have to connect with each other and to share the real deep nature of our humanity. And so I think ridiculous, being ridiculously human means being ridiculously real and being ridiculously authentic so that we have the possibility of deep and meaningful connections with others because that's central to life and humanity. And that was impromptu, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew I was going to say something about authenticity, but... <laughs> that was awesome. That's so cool. Well, thank you so much. So, so Lisa, like, seriously, it's been like an absolute pleasure to have you on our show. It's just, uh, uh, yeah, I just love chatting to you. It was literally like, three friends having a cool chat you know like about various different things and you're you're such um an inspirational lady seriously like you i don't know there's this real like openness about you and I, and i feel like that that openness has maybe like guided you in your life you know you've kind of been like accepting of things sort of coming into you and then maybe just sort of letting them guide you, you know, and, and like I said, there's, there's this sort of big convergence of things happening now. And it's, uh, it's really amazing to see. And I just love how you are so comfortable within yourself and you just sort of, you just embrace everything. And, and this is, uh, this is just like really motivational for people to see, you know what I mean? And, and to kind of uh, witness and, and also just your passion for, for communities and for helping people. And I think um, the, the more people in the world that we can have like you, the better. And um, your, just your, your kind of drive and determination to, to help with, uh, you know, education, I think is massive. I think uh, Mandela, he has, a, has an amazing quote about education, which I, I'm not even going to mention it, but he's like, he's like, this is the number one thing in the world. If we can really sort of educate our children, it's going to sort of just, um, you know, make the world such a prosperous and awesome place. And then you're definitely doing like a big, big part of that. So um, thank you so much. Uh, you, you're a really smart lady, uh, all different types of smart. <laughs> and, um, you know, just have such a big smile and you tell your story so well. So thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say, you know, I have a guest that says, I'm just going to breathe that in because, you know, recognition and appreciation is transformative. And sometimes we don't take the time to really let other people's words of appreciation in. And I just really want to tell you that you're taking the time to share that with me is, is really a big gift. And I'm taking it in as a transformative and healing, um, you know, thing. And so I thank you for that. And I also still quite deeply indulged in being able to tell so much of my story and with so much of a, a you know beautiful listening and and just you know i have this uh mentor who talks about listening in in a way that people can't help but bloom in your presence and she calls it fertile listening and i feel that you really have given me the gift and you give all of your guests that gift of just being such fertile listeners where they just can't help but be their best and i i feel i've been the recipient uh, that honor today. So I just want to say thank you um, for providing that for the people that I get to hear and for me to spend all this time talking about me. me, me. <laughs> <laughs> well, just briefly really from my side, <laughs> yeah, that's super kind of you. And you know, like you, exactly what Gareth said as well. You know, we, we and also we are we have felt indulged and grateful to have you share so openly because you break molds and you and you you know this is this is what people need more of and and just the the proof of how being adaptable in one's life can be such a valuable skill to have you know and and just um and be okay with following the flow of life and and realizing that it it has these weird twists and turns and and it's fun you know you have so much you just look like you're having fun at life and you've got this massive heart space heart, this heart centered sort of way about you which is is really tangible seriously and um and also your art your your creative side sort of comes through your your language as well definitely you articulate your story so well and uh, you know you definitely um seem so well rounded with with just um with with life you know so 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 inspiring so thanks for that again and uh, we can't wait to see all the great stuff that you that you're doing and yeah, you know, like as we get older, it's so great to look up to someone like yourself and go like, you're doing it gracefully and artfully. And it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's a great, like, you know, that you see so much 
doom and gloom and, and you just bringing this happiness and this positivity. So thanks for that. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, you guys. You're such a gift. And I just feel so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Uh, cool. <laughs> cool. All right, Lisa. Thanks so much. Um, yeah. Breaking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging.